Hello, now we come to a short lesson introducing recommender systems and discussing um, one interesting um, feature of them, the so-called long tail, which long tail is seen in many areas of endeavor. So we've already given examples, and here we just summarize the problem. It's the personalized matching of items that include people. That's LinkedIn, which is matching people to people. Matching items to people, or perhaps collections of items to collections of people. People's to products is online and offline commerce. People to people is social network, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. People to jobs or employers are job sites like uh, Career Builder or Monster. People plus their queries to the web, that's information retrieval, uh, which we will discuss later on as a different use case. That's Bing, Google, etc. And the recommender systems help in the match of the users with these items. And their goal is to uh, give good recommendations, which sort of ease the information overload. Because if you browse everything you could do, uh, you wouldn't be able to do very much. And it's in some sense like automated sales assistance. It's either guidance, advisory, it could be persuasion. Uh, there are many things it can be. So if we look at the characteristics of the different solutions, there are many different system designs and paradigms. We all see uh, user-based collaborative filtering and item-based collaborative filtering. Those are different paradigms exploiting uh, um, nearby users or exploiting nearby items. Uh, what you do is based on the availability of exploitable data, the speed with which it takes to do the exploitation. Um, user feedback, which is um, implicit and explicit, you want to build that in. There's a lot, of, obviously, a lot of progress has been made recently in customizing the user, the interface to internet sites based on what they remember about you. And then every domain has its different characteristics. And you also have to remember that what's important is the goal. Your goal is to be as happy as possible, spend as little money as possible being happy. And uh, the, however, the goal of the Internet site, which may not be owned by the, um, which may actually be a, a portal to other sites, is that the collection of site owners make the most money or do whatever they need. Or else in the case of, say, Netflix, not only does Netflix wants to make money, it wants to do it in a way that preserves the customer. So it's not just money today, it's integrated money over the foreseeable future. So we have to, we want to make certain you spend more money at Amazon, or you rent another movie, or as I say, you can actually have a slightly more complicated case where you have a Yahoo portal, say, that portal actually is trying to persuade you to click, which allows you to spend money at a commerce site and benefiting a particular manufacturer of whatever product you, you, you find. So that's pretty complicated. So actually trying to make the decision about whether to make the user happy, the site owner happy, uh, the manufacturer of whatever we're going to eventually click on, that's uh, not trivial. So here we have, if you read this, um, you know, the business uh, news, you'll, think, you'll see things like click, click through and conversion. These are the, what happens, this is a measure of how successful a site is. And so, of course, they're all connected. A happy user is a user that comes back to the site, and that's what the site owner wants to do. So we're not actually ignoring the user. We simply have a slight slant on what we do. And all of this, all of these are very complicated problems with lots of um, aspects, and we have to mix all of the above. And as we'll see, everything is really quite remarkable in that there's no theory here. They're just the data. Everything comes from the data. We use previous data to decide what to do. And that's a remarkable feature of these recommender engines. They're all data based. Based on data, I should say. They're not particularly using databases. Here we now have a little bit of a side on the so-called long tail, which came from a famous book well, by Chris Anderson in 2006. And it discusses uh, the importance of identifying items that the user had no idea existed. 
And an interesting feature of the, of the online stores is they actually sell more or less popular items. Because it's presumably, we can use the technology of these recommender engines to bring these less popular items to people's attention. Uh, here's a page uh, on, the, on the left, which uh, comes from um, uh, Anderson's book. And it has a comparison of Rhapsody, Amazon, and Netflix. And it compares uh, what, what um, fraction of sales comes from what you might call traditional things and the long tail. The long tail is in yellow. And you see Amazon is 50% comes from the long tail. Netflix is 20 and Rhapsody is 22%. Here we have a way of looking at the long tail, which we'll see in an, another picture. We plot um, a number of number of plays of a movie or a, or a piece of music against uh, the, um, in a way that you do, you count how many items there are, how many say music items there are which are played this many times, and you'll get a few items which are played an enormous number of times. Those are the songs you will find in your brick and mortar shops. And uh, probably you even might know about. And then out here in the long tail, we just have lots and lots of items which are just not sung or bought or what have you very much. And here's some interesting um, picture over here about the bricks and mortar retailer. Uh, at the top and the uh, long tail retailer or the internet shop on the bottom. Um, you might for products have a uh, um, 20% uh, uh, in this uh, category here, 80% not so um, um, not so common. They're in the so intermediate range. When we go to the long tail, we like tell it only has the same ratio here, two 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 percent to eight percent, but has a 90% of those products of what things would not be in your brick and mortar retailer. But if you look at this, you'll find the um, most of the revenues come from this 20%. 80% of the revenues come from 20% of the products. 20% of the revenues from 80%. And all the profits come from these red things, because that's just um, that's the nature of that business. In the long tail case, it's sort of different. We have this yellow, which is so uncommon, but they're so, see they dominate. 90% of the items are in this long tail category, which is just so rarely you um, purchased that then you won't find them in a brick and mortar um, place. And so here's sort of a, this symbolic um, schematic that uh, for uh, for the actual revenues, 50% comes from uh, the most common, 25% from the least less common but still present in the uh, in the brick and mortar site, and 25% from the items which are only in the uh, online site. And then there's a similar ratio for profits. So this is an important thing to bear in mind. And in some sense, this is a win-win situation. Um, the online site, site is making money from the long tail, and the users are benefiting from the long tail, because they would never have seen the long tail without the online site. We have the same type of thing. Uh, we'll see that in many different areas, areas of science. We will see the long tail. We've already actually mentioned that in the uh, discussing uh, big science versus little science. Some areas, say like biology, involve a lot of scientists, not 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 in huge single projects. Uh, although there are some huge single projects in biology, like uh, sequencing the genome, but. Um, it's if we compare that with the LHC, that is 3,000 people in one project. So, um, if we again look at the search, we then now plot the volume of searches, search against the number of search term variations, and you will find that small, um, the, the, there's a high volume of very short searches. And a small volume of very specific searches. And the very specific searches are often the most uh, fruitful because they narrow down the field much better and they give her a result which is more helpful to the user. So now we basically um, 
define the recommender system. We have a user, and a user request. I want to buy, I want to search, I want a job. I want to make a friend online, and a set of items. Um, the websites, friends, um, jobs, um, books to buy. And then the recommender system is meant to return a list of these items, hopefully ranked by um, such that the ones at the top of that list are the ones most likely to be interesting to the user. We sometimes use the word relevance there. We want to sort the uh, list by relevance. And that term is actually often used on the internet. You will find that uh, in your, when you have um, an option for return, say books, you can search by relevance, which is what the site thinks you'll be interested in, search by price, search by date of issue, and so on. Um, this has all got lots of so-called contexts, because it's all done for different, uh, um, in different uh, worlds. So Netflix, uh, which is particularly clear, because often the movie uh, and the Netflix uh, system is used by many different individuals. So you'll get a different answer for each individual, and a different answer for the household than you would for any one individual. And so when we look at our recommender engines, we're going to look at this context. We're going to look at the information about the users. We're going to look at what other users have done. And we're going to look at uh, the properties of the item. Then, when I'm doing Netflix, I might want to say I'm only interested in sci-fi, or I'm only interested in movies about red balloons. And then we use technologies, which are collaborative filtering and related machine learning technology, which combine all these criteria into an amazing uh, um, machine. Totally, it's still called machine learning, a total system. Netflix is system has hundreds, I mean, the, the winner of the Netflix competition had over a hundred different components in his recommendation system. And so these are pretty sophisticated and complicated. And they're all actually sort of ad hoc, because there is no theory here. But they're actually pretty, not as we'll see when we look at the testing of in this field. They're not so, um, they're pretty scientific in that it's very easy in some sense to decide whether they're any good. You just um, change your recommender system to a new recommender system and see whether your criteria of success and change positively or negatively. So now we move on to a discussion on this Kegel site, which has competitions, which competition included a very famous one uh, set up by Netflix. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next lesson.